Good afternoon. Uh, let me begin by thanking my great friend, Prime Minister Cameron, and his entire team for hosting this NATO summit and making it such a success. And I want to thank the people of Newport and Cardiff and the people of Wales for wel welcoming uh, me and my delegation uh, so warmly. Uh, it's a great honor to be the first sitting U.S. President to visit Wales. Uh, we've met at a time of transition and a time of testing. After more than a decade, NATO's combat mission in Afghanistan is coming to an end. Russia's aggression against Ukraine threatens our vision of a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace. In the Middle East, the terrorist threat from ISIL poses a growing danger. Here at this summit, our alliance has summoned the will, the resources, and the capabilities to meet all of these challenges. First and foremost, we have reaffirmed the central mission of the Alliance. Article 5 enshrines our solemn duty to each other. An armed attack against one shall be considered an attack against them all. This is a binding treaty obligation. It is non-negotiable. And here in Wales, we've left absolutely no doubt. We will defend every ally. Second, we agreed to be resolute in reassuring our allies in Eastern Europe. Increased NATO air patrols over the Baltics will continue. Rotations of additional forces throughout Eastern Europe for training and exercises will continue. Naval patrols in the Black Sea will continue. And all 28 NATO nations agreed to contribute to all of these measures for as long as necessary. Third, to ensure that NATO remains prepared for any contingency, we agreed to a new readiness action plan. The Alliance will update its defense planning. We will create a new highly ready rapid response force that can be deployed on a very short notice. We'll increase NATO's presence in Central and Eastern Europe with additional equipment, training, exercises, and troop rotations. And the $1 billion initiative that I announced in Warsaw will be a strong and ongoing U.S. contribution to this plan. Fourth, all 28 NATO nations have pledged to increase their investments in defense and to move toward investing 2 percent of their GDP in our collective security. These resources will help NATO invest in critical capabilities, including intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and missile defense. And this commitment makes clear that NATO will not be complacent. Our alliance will reverse the decline in defense spending and rise to meet the challenges that we face in the 21st century. Fifth, our alliance is fully united in support of Ukraine's sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity and its right to defend itself. To back up this commitment, all 28 NATO allies will now provide security assistance to Ukraine. This includes non-lethal support to the Ukrainian military, like body armor, fuel, and medical care for wounded Ukrainian troops, as well as assistance to help modernize Ukrainian forces, including logistics and command and control. Here in Wales, we also sent a strong message to Russia that actions have consequences. Today, the United States and Europe are finalizing measures to deepen and broaden our sanctions across Russia's financial, energy, and defense sectors. At the same time, we strongly support President Poroshenko's efforts to pursue a peaceful resolution to the conflict in his country. The ceasefire announced today can advance that goal, but only if there is follow-through on the ground. Pro-Russian separatists must keep their commitments, and Russia must stop its violations of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Beyond Europe, we pay tribute to all those from our ISAF mission, including more than 2,200 Americans who have given their lives for our security in Afghanistan. NATO's combat mission ends in three months, and we are prepared to transition to a new mission focused on training, advising, and assisting Afghan security forces. Both presidential candidates have pledged to sign the bilateral, uh, bilateral security agreement that would be the foundation of our continued cooperation. But uh, as we all know, the outcome of the recent election must be resolved. And so we continue to urge the two presidential candidates to make the compromises that are necessary 
so Afghans can move forward together uh, and form a sovereign, united, and democratic nation. Finally, we reaffirm that the door to NATO membership remains open to nations that can meet our high standards. We agreed to expand the partnership that makes NATO the hub of global security. We're launching a new effort with our closest partners, including many that have served with us in Afghanistan, to make sure our forces continue to operate together. And we'll create a new initiative to help countries build their defense capabilities, starting with Georgia, Moldova, Jordan, and Libya. I also leave here confident that NATO allies and partners are prepared to join in a broad international effort to combat the threat posed by ISIL. Already, uh, already allies have joined us in Iraq, uh, where we have stopped ISIL's advances. We've equipped our Iraqi partners and helped them go on offense. NATO has agreed to play a role in providing security and humanitarian assistance to those who are on the front lines. Key NATO allies stand ready to confront this terrorist threat through military, intelligence, and law enforcement, as well as diplomatic efforts. And Secretary Kerry will now travel to the region to continue building the broad-based coalition that will enable us to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. So taken together, I think the progress we've achieved in Wales makes it clear that our alliance will continue to do whatever is necessary to ensure our collective defense and to protect our citizens. So with that, let me uh, take a few questions. I'll start with Julie Pace of Associated Press. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to go back to the situation in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. If this ceasefire does take effect and appears to be holding, would you and your European counterparts back away from these sanctions that you say you've prepared? Or do you feel that it's important to levy these sanctions regardless of this ceasefire agreement? And if I could go back to the rapid response force, can you say specifically what U.S. contributions will be in terms of troop numbers and equipment? Is it beyond the agreement that you announced or the proposal you announced in Warsaw? With respect to uh, the ceasefire agreement, obviously we are hopeful, but based on past experience, also skeptical uh, that, uh, in fact, the separatists will follow through and the Russians will stop violating Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. So it has to be tested. Uh, and I know that the Europeans uh, are discussing, uh, at this point, the final shape of their sanctions measures. Uh, it's my view that if you look at President Poroshenko's plan, it is going to take a, some time to implement. Uh, and as a consequence, for us to move forward based on what is currently happening on the ground with sanctions, uh, while acknowledging that if, in fact, the elements of the plan that has been signed are implemented, then those sanctions could be lifted. Uh, is a more likely way uh, for us to ensure that uh, there's follow-through. Uh, but that's something that, uh, obviously, uh, we'll consult closely with our European partners uh, to determine. Uh, I do want to point out, though, uh, that the only reason that we're seeing this ceasefire at this moment is because of both the sanctions that have already been applied and the threat of further sanctions, which are having a real impact on the Russian economy. Uh, and have isolated Russia in a way that we have not seen in a very long time. Uh, the path for Russia to rejoin the community of nations that respects international law is still there. Uh, and we encourage President Putin to take it. Uh, but the unity and the firmness that we've seen in the transatlantic alliance in supporting Ukraine uh, and applying sanctions uh, has been, uh, I think, a testimony to how seriously people take the basic principle that uh, big countries can't uh, just stomp on little countries or force them uh, to change their policies uh, and, and uh, give up their sovereignty. So uh, I, I'm very uh, pleased with the kind of work that's been done throughout this crisis in Ukraine, uh, and uh, I think U.S. leadership has been critical uh, throughout that process. Uh, with respect to the rapid uh, response forces uh, and the readiness action plan that we put forward, in Warsaw I announced $1 billion in our uh, initiative. A sizable portion of that will be devoted to implementing 
uh, various aspects of this, uh, this readiness action plan. Uh, we've already increased, obviously, rotations uh, of personnel uh, in the Baltic states, for example. Uh, we have the uh, air policing. We have the activities that are taking place uh, in uh, the Baltic uh, and the Black Sea. But this allows us to supplement it. It allows us to coordinate it and integrate it further uh, with additional contributions from other partners. And uh, what it signifies is NATO's recognition that uh, in light of recent Russian actions as well as rhetoric, uh, we want to make it crystal clear. We mean what we say when we're talking about uh, our Article 5 commitments. And uh, an increased presence serves as the most effective deterrent uh, to any additional Russian aggression that we might see. Uh, Angela King, Bloomberg. Thank you, Mr. President. What are your specific expectations for what regional actors like Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Jordan can legitimately provide to a coalition against Islamic State? Is there a role there for Iran as well? As you know, Secretary Kerry today said that he expects the allied countries to coalesce around a specific plan by the end of September. Do you agree with the timeline that he set out? And what concrete commitments, if any, are you leaving this summit with from the other nations that were here? Let me start with a general point. Uh, there was unanimity over the last two days that ISIL poses a significant threat to NATO members. And there was a recognition that we have to take action. I did not get any resistance or pushback uh, to the basic notion that we have a critical role to play in rolling back uh, this savage organization that is causing so much chaos in the region uh, and is harming so many people and poses a long-term threat to uh, the safety and security of NATO members. So uh, there's great conviction that we have to act as part of the international community to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Uh, and that was extremely encouraging. Uh, beyond that, what we have already seen is uh, significant support from a variety of member states for specific actions that we've been taking in Iraq. Keep in mind, we've taken already 100 strikes in Iraq that have had a significant impact on degrading their capabilities and making sure that we're protecting U.S. citizens, critical infrastructure, providing the space for the Iraqi government to form. Uh, our hope is that the Iraqi government uh, is actually formed and finalized next week. Uh, that then allows us uh, to work with them on a broader strategy. And you know, some of the assistance has been in the form of airlift or humanitarian assistance. Much of it has been providing additional arms uh, to uh, the Peshmerga and the Iraqi security forces. Uh, there's been logistical support, intelligence uh, and surveillance, uh, and reconnaissance support. Uh, and so uh, a variety of folks with different c capabilities uh, have uh, already made a contribution. I'm confident that we're going to be able to build on that strong foundation and the clear commitment and have uh, the kind of coalition that will be required for the sustained effort we need uh, to push ISIL back. Um, now, John Kerry is going to be traveling the region to have further consultations with the regional actors and the regional players. And I think it is absolutely critical that we have uh, Arab states and specifically Sunni majority states that are rejecting the kind of extremist uh, uh, nihilism that we're seeing out of ISIL, that say that is not what Islam is about, and are prepared to join us uh, actively in the fight. Uh, and uh, you know, my expectation is, is that we will see friends and allies and partners of ours in the region prepared to take action as well as part of a coalition. 
One of our tasks, though, is also going to be to build capability. Uh, well, what we've learned in Iraq uh, is, uh, yes, ISIL has significant capabilities, and they combine terrorist tactics with traditional uh, military tactics uh, to significant effect. But part of the problem also is, is that uh, we haven't seen as effective a fighting force on the part of the Iraqi security forces uh, as we need. And we're going to have to focus on the capable units that are already there, bolster them, bolster the work that the Peshmerga has done. We can support them from the air, but ultimately we're going to need a, a strong ground game, and we're also going to need uh, the Sunni tribes in many of these areas to recognize that their future is not with the kind of uh, fanaticism that uh, ISIL represents, so that they start uh, taking the fight to ISIL as well. And that's going to require the sort of uh, regional partnerships uh, that we're talking about. In terms of timetable, uh, we are working deliberately. If you look at what we've done over the last several months, we've taken this in stages. First stage is to make sure that we were encouraging Iraqi government formation. Second stage was making sure that building on the intelligence assessments uh, that we had done, that we were in a position to conduct limited airstrikes to protect uh, our personnel, critical infrastructure, and engage in humanitarian activities. The third phase will allow us to take the fight to ISIL, broaden the effort, uh, and uh, our goal is to act with urgency, but also to make sure that we're doing it right, that we have the right targets, that there's support on the ground if we take uh, an airstrike, that we have a strong uh, political coalition, diplomatic uh, e uh, effort that is matching it, a strong uh, strategic communications effort so that we are discouraging people from uh, thinking somehow that ISIL uh, represents uh, a state, much less a, a caliphate. Uh, so all those things are going to have to be combined. Uh, and uh, as I said, it's not going to happen overnight, but we are steadily moving in the right direction. And we are going to achieve our goal. We are going to degrade and ultimately defeat ISIL, the same way that we have gone after al Qaeda, uh, the same way that we have gone after uh, the uh, Al Qaeda affiliate in Somalia, where uh, we released today the fact that we had killed the leader of uh, Al Shabaab in Somalia uh, and have consistently worked to degrade their operations. Um, you know, we have been very systematic and methodical uh, in going after these kinds of organizations that may threaten uh, U.S. personnel and, and uh, the homeland. And that deliberation allows us to do it right. Um, but uh, have no doubt, uh, we will continue, and I will continue, to do what is necessary to protect the American people. And ISIL poses a real threat, and I'm encouraged by the fact that our friends and allies recognize that same threat. Julie Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to follow up on what you were saying about ISIL and ask um, if, if you think that the objective here is to destroy and degrade them. Are those the same thing in your mind? Mm -hmm. um, is, is the goal to, um, to ultimately, the, uh, Secretary Kerry said that there's no containing them, so is the goal to ultimately annihilate them? And also, um, you talked about the importance of um, expertise on the ground and building up capacity on the ground. Um, do you think, since airstrikes are not going to do it here, mm -hmm. if ultimately action is needed in Syria, can you realistically expect the Free Syrian Army to do what's needed on the ground to really destroy, not just push back ISIL? Mm -hmm. You can't contain an organization that is running roughshod through that much territory, uh, causing that much havoc, displacing that many people, uh, killing that many innocents, enslaving that many women. Uh, the goal has to be uh, to dismantle them. And if you look at what happened with Al Qaeda in the Fatah, where their primary base was, you initially 
push them back. You systematically uh, degrade their capabilities. You narrow their scope of action. Uh, you slowly shrink the space, the territory uh, that they may control. Um, you take out their leadership. And over time, they are not able to conduct the same kinds of terrorist attacks uh, as they once could. As I said, I think, in my last press conference, given the nature of these organizations, are there potentially remnants of an organization that are still running around in hiding uh, and still potentially plotting? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and we will continue to hunt them down the same way we're doing with remnants of al-Qaeda in the Fatah or elements uh, of al-Shabaab in Somalia or terrorists who operate uh, anywhere around the world. But what we can accomplish is to dismantle this network, this force that has claimed uh, to control this much territory uh, so that they can't do us harm. Uh, and, and that's going to be our objective. And as I said before, I'm, I'm pleased to see that uh, there's unanimity uh, among our friends and allies that that is a worthy goal and they are prepared uh, to work with us in accomplishing that goal. Uh, with respect to the situation on the ground in Syria, uh, we will not be placing U.S. ground troops to try to control uh, uh, the areas that are part of the conflict inside of Syria. I don't think that's necessary for us to accomplish our goal. We are going to have to find effective partners on the ground to push back against ISIL. Uh, and the moderate coalition there is one that we can work with. We have experience working with many of them. They have been, to some degree, outgunned uh, and outmanned. Uh, and that's why it's important for us to work with our friends and allies to support them more effectively. Uh, but keep in mind that when you have uh, U.S. forces, other advanced nations uh, going after ISIL and putting them on the defensive and putting them on the run, it's pretty remarkable what then ground forces can do, uh, even if initially they were uh, uh, on the defensive against ISIL. So that is a developing strategy uh, that uh, we are going to be consulting with our friends, our allies, our regional partners. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, we will do what is necessary in order to make sure that ISIL uh, does not uh, threaten the United States or our friends and partners. Okay? Uh, one last question. Uh, Colleen. Uh, Colleen Nelson, Wall Street Journal. Thank you, Mr. President. Some Senate Democrats who are facing tough races in November have asked you to delay action on immigration. How have the concerns of other Democrats influenced your thinking, and do you see any downside at this point to delaying until after the election? Uh, I have to tell you that this week uh, I've been pretty busy, focused on Ukraine and focused on uh, ISIL and focused on making sure that uh, NATO is, is boosting its commitments. Uh, and, and following through on what's necessary to meet 21st century challenges. Uh, Jay Johnson and Eric Holder have begun to provide me some of their proposals and recommendations. Uh, I'll be reviewing them. And uh, you know, my expectation is that fairly soon uh, I'll be considering uh, what the next steps are. What I'm unequivocal about is that we need immigration reform that my overriding preference is to see Congress act. We had bipartisan action in the Senate. The House Republicans have sat on it for over a year. That has damaged the economy. Uh, it, it has held America back. Uh, it is a mistake. And in the absence of congressional action, I intend to take action uh, to make sure that we're putting more resources on the border that we're upgrading how we process uh, uh, these cases, and that we find a way to encourage legal immigration and give people
people some path so that they can start paying taxes and uh, pay a fine and learn English and uh, be able to not look over their shoulder but uh, be legal uh, since they've been living here for quite some time. Uh, so, you know, I suspect that on my flight back, this will be part of my, uh, my reading, uh, taking a look at uh, some of the specifics that we've looked at, uh, and I'll be making an announcement soon. But uh, I want to be very clear. Uh, my intention is in the absence of, uh, in the absence of action by uh, Congress, uh, I'm going to do what I can do uh, within uh, the legal constraints of my office, because it's the right thing to do for the country. All right? Thank you very much, people of Wales. I had a wonderful time.